Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm James. And I'm Reed. And we're two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Mm-hmm. So uh, Nick Baker is out gallivanting around Milan. I know. What an asshole. <laughs> Just gets to go to Europe, hanging out. I know. It's not like he gave me months worth of notice and... I don't know. But we got Reed Schlegel in here last minute. Thank God. I know. I had to clear my entire schedule. Yeah, we paid a lot of money. I'm talking a lot of doubloons. Nick's just smoking a cigarette with creamer shade right now. <laughs> getting creamy. Having an espresso. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, Reed, yeah. Uh, what's going on, man? I mean, we've known each other since college. It's true. Um, can I bring up something that uh, that you said about me in in the episode where I was gone? If it's a good thing. <laughs> you described me as a twinkle down the street. Explain yourself. A twinkle down the street. <laughs> uh, I think what I meant was you're somebody that brightens my day who lives oh. down the street. I, that So everybody stop texting me. I'm not a prostitute. Hmm. Oh, like you were a twink down the street. <laughs> oh, I get what you mean now. <laughs> That's not what I meant. No, I I figured. But uh, but yeah, Reed, we've known each other since, I guess, second year of industrial design. Ten years. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, a third of our lives. I got to start saving for retirement. Yeah. Everyone, that should be a whole topic. Save for your retirement <laughs> early. Brought to you by Prudential, right? Fidelity. Fidelity. I don't know. Slavic. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, Reed, um, yes, we have this established background. But mm-hmm. what I want to know is, what's new in your life? What's what's going on? Um, last week, I went and spoke at the Thinking Creatively conference at Keene, or sorry, Kane University. I did not know it was pronounced that way. I even applied there as a student in high school. It, didn't find it out until last week. I hope you didn't start your presentation with any sort of rhymes to Keen. No, I don't. I don't rap. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Funny side note: my mom used to do rap improv in New York City back in the seventies and eighties. Really? Yeah, that's a whole different podcast. But is she, she a B girl, B boy. Uh, she's an actress and she loves improv. Okay. And she used to rap to Run DMC, and if you give her a few wines, she'll do it now. It's pretty funny. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what was your talk about? The whole conference was about creativity and inspiration. So I did a topic on how to find your own inspiration. And I basically did the whole thing of think, making everyone think the presentation was about Les Manouche and all these sites, which are great and everyone mm. uses them. But it's, yeah. that's not where the inspiration ends. I basically framed it as a lot of the inspiration you have inside of yourself already, where if you just step out of studio or your job, Get some fresh air is an easy one, but the bigger thing is getting out of your own way. And we had the whole mental health podcast Mm -hmm. and talking about just being able to calm your mind so you get rid of all that clutter so you can actually see what's there. And a lot of times if you mix that with things like Les Manouche and Eyes Wide Open or whatever Tumblr, Instagram, Pinterest thing you like, you'll think of things that are a little more unique to yourself. Mm, That's cool. Yeah, because that's that's something that I often encounter is I feel... I feel the ever ever present nature of all of this imagery that I've taken in. And sometimes I wonder if an idea that I've had is original or whether I saw it somewhere. Yeah. Because, you know, between Pinterest and Lemonouche and Instagram, there's just so much that we're exposed to on a daily basis. Except my former intern, who is now transitioned to full-time, very proud of him, showed me something called arena it's a-r-e dot n-a and it's a whole new much more i don't know design focused version of pinterest Mm. and it's pretty sweet i've been dabbling with that and i kind of want to get on that platform so it's a whole new version of things that the algorithm pushes in front of me a-r-e dot n-a dot n-a 
Let's see if we can boot it up. Yeah, you got to sign up. It's got a whole thing. Okay, cool. But it's great because it really tags where it comes from too. Yeah. So it's not just you got a photo and something in a different language and you can't find it where it came from. You can actually go back to the source, give the person credit and find more work from those people if you really want it. That's awesome. That's very cool. <clears throat> yep. Um, so, what so about yeah. You? Uh, what about me? Well, let's look at the, uh, at the list here. Well, I'm going to speak at uh, ASU at the end of the month, actually, uh, the 25th. Um, of April and I'm speaking not only to industrial designers, but apparently I'm speaking in front of students and faculty from the design school as a whole. Who is in design school? Uh, graphic architecture. Nice. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, uh, experimentation in design. Um, so I need to, uh, start thinking about how I want to craft my talk towards people aside from industrial designers. I don't think it's that different. I feel like we're all the same. We just have different skills, especially if you're a student. Like I remember we'd go to talks for the whole design school and it could be an architect. Do you go to the one where Disney came and they hired a bunch of industrial designers and architects? Was that, was it Pixar? Pixar. Yeah. That's it, yeah. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was, that was pretty sweet. Did wait. So your talk at, at Kane was mm -hmm. that to industrial designers or that was that just creatives in general? It was everyone. It was advertising, interior design, architecture, industrial design. Okay. And it was one of the bigger crowds I spoke to. I think it was like 250 people wow. or something like that. That's awesome. It was fun. Yeah, it was a good time. They had a really stacked lineup. The guy before me was a designer at Nike and now he's the lead creative director at MTV. And That's then the sweet. woman after me was Lauren Wan. And she was, she had the most infectious, positive energy I've ever seen of any <laughs> human. Like she was a painter and illustrator and she could do so many styles. And she's known as the unofficial queen of porcelain, I think is what it was, or dishware. Oh. Where like half of the take, the, like it's called porcelainware, dishware, um, it's called bedding and wallpaper are mostly her work. That's amazing. And she was just awesome. What's and her name? Lauren Wan. It's Lauren Wan Design. Something like that is her Instagram page. Wan. Uh, how w, do you... w A N. Yeah, so she does all these great floral things, but she also does scenery. She does, she's gotten, she was really funny. Her husband was, is an industrial designer who actually used to work at Smart Design. Oh, no way. And he got her an iPad. So a bunch of her newer work is digital. Yeah. And that was really cool because people picked it up just as much as her watercolor work and everything. That's sweet. But yeah, hearing her speak, it was just like, holy crap, I've never seen someone so happy about design. <laughs> and it was very refreshing. It was nice. Yeah. Did you, did you pull anything big from any of the other speakers that were up there? Uh, I think hers was the most impactful to me, honestly, just from the energy. I feel like once you go to enough conferences, you kind of hear a lot of similar things. Right. Um, but that one was the one that stuck out the most to me. Yeah. It was hers. Um, sorry, everybody. If you're watching the YouTube, I, it's, it's, uh, it's going like a 56 K modem right now, but we've got, we've got some plates going on. This, these are beautiful. Yeah. Anthropology. She, she had done everything under the sun. It was yeah. pretty awesome. And That's... she does it all by herself. She's done freelance since the day she graduated from the Royal Arts wow. Academy. And she's never gone back. That's what she's done her whole life. Is she British? Yep. Oh, cool. Well, I think she's... I'm not sure if she was born... She's um, Chinese, but I think she grew up in Britain. I'm okay. probably getting this wrong. Her <laughs> Just husband is British. Go ahead and look her up. Uh, that's uh, Lauren, Lauren Wan com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So, have you spoken to non-industrial designers before? I don't think I ever have, except for in daily life. Okay. Oh yeah, but but, but I've them. I've never <laughs> I've never I've never had to talk to them at any sort of level of I guess expertise mm -hmm. to to pass on a skill or something like that. I mean, I know that you have also done workshops at the various companies that you've worked at to non-designers. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any tips? To, to speaking to non-designers or not non-designers, but people outside of industrial design. They're all people, James. It's okay. okay. All I, right. I mean, I think for me, I spoke at the museum. I did a workshop for the Museum of Natural History mm -hmm. um, and their design team. And that was fun because not only were they not industrial designers, they all were older than me like yeah. significantly. So that was one where I was a little nervous going to it. But after you do it, you realize people are just genuinely interested in creativity. So right. just say what you gotta say they're gonna like it all right okay 
Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, by the way, Nick, if you're watching the podcast, I'm sorry. I'm I'm indulging in some beer. Uh, you know, when the cat's away, James will play, right? <laughs> where that phrase came from but it's a good one <laughs> i tried to copy your <laughs> didn't come out very well last listen time. it's it's a lot of watching carl on aqua Teen hunger force and oh my god uh, just hearing people in new york can i tell a story uh please do when james and i were in one of our many late nights at studio i don't remember why but i have a vivid memory of you taking aqua Teen hunger force putting on mute and doing all of the voices no, this. Let me uh, uh, let me set the stage. It was actually on the car ride, on the van ride oh, back from IDSA Austin mm. when we were juniors, and it was me and Chris Carpenter. It was good do, doing the voices. Can you do a meat wad really quick? Yeah, I can do a meat wad really quick. So, All right, guys. If you guys know that, we know how old you are. If you don't, we know how old you are. So We know how old you are, and now we know where you live. Yeah, it's got real creepy. Um, by the way, I, I meant to, in the last podcast, I, I mentioned some some cool kids that came up to us at the end of our podcast at Purdue, and I wanted to give them a shout-out. So shout-out to Gus, Travis, Chase, and Nick. Woo! Yeah! Good luck at Purdue. I mean, have you heard about the Purdue program and the gauntlet that those kids have to go through? Yeah, that's why I didn't go there. <laughs> no, but seriously. Because I got, I got into Purdue and I was looking at schools and it freaked me out that they cut half the program after sophomore yeah. year. So shout out to you soldiers out there. So yeah. And also, guys, my family's off from Indiana. My cousin's wife is from... Or, yeah, my cousin's wife was from over there. So Stop trying to ingratiate yourself into the Midwest. Guys, I just want to be accepted <laughs> in all parts of the country. Um, we wanted, I wanted to touch back um, on a topic that we talked about in the last episode. And, and Reed, I don't know if, uh, if you know about this or if you heard the last episode, but this whole thing about mm -hmm. Karen Rashid and the unpaid internship. I and I to want today. to know what you think about this. Um. So I liked both sides of the argument. I thought I am very staunchly on the side of your time is worth money, so you should be paid. Right. But thinking about it, it is an argument to be said that if you're not actually getting the... If you're taking two steps forward and one step back, I don't know. I think my final conclusion is that you should always be paid, but you shouldn't be paid like exceptionally well, maybe. Like, right. I feel like... I never had a, I never had an internship that paid me less than eighteen dollars an hour. Right. So I, for me, that is like, that's fair. That's fair yeah. money. Yeah, it was really interesting because the Discord lit up with with conversation over this topic, mm -hmm. and and it was actually pretty much split down the middle between the people on Discord, which was I was kind of surprised because I felt like I was I was kind of arguing a an unpopular opinion. Mm -hmm. Um in some ways and uh so if i can characterize the way that it's split i mean uh, there were a lot of people saying that you know work should be paid no matter what they were also calling out the fact that people who are maybe underprivileged um they don't have the money they don't have that kind of money uh, to yeah. you know they so that kind of excludes them from that sort of experience um while other people were saying Hey, you know, if Karen Rashid wants to do this, it's out in the open. We know that he's doing this. Yeah. So it's up to him. And then it's up to people whether they're okay with that and whether, you know, they're okay with being unpaid. Um, uh, another thing that the, that the uh, opposing side brought up. Oh, gosh, what was it? Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about it and remember it. But was it school credit? Um. That's something I was thinking about because that's kind of being paid if you're right. saving money, right? That you would pay anyway somewhere else. Yeah, it's not as great, but it's not nothing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I can't remember what the other point was, um, but yeah, I, those were those were basically the the two arguments that were being made. And mm -hmm. oh, the 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 other thing that the opposing side was saying was, could this could this start a trend? of unpaid internships of people thinking that unpaid internships are okay like employers 
it's not like Kareem Rashid invented this. Everyone's like, no. wait, we can get work for free? <laughs> no, this is how it is. Yeah, my my argument to that was I think that, and and there were people that did not agree with me at all to this, but in my in my experience, employment has gotten more transparent and I would say more ethical mm-hmm. um, in in the recent years. Like, you know, people are very transparent about hiring practices and and things like that and and paying workers. And, you know, if you're trying to attract top talent, I feel like, you know, if you can distinguish yourself by being like, hey, you could come work for me. I have a really great name as a designer and I'll also pay you. Yep. Um, but one thing that I will say for anybody who is interested in the Karen Rashid internship or interested in a paid, unpaid internship, I was trying to think of like, what kind like what would i advise that person to do in that position mm-hmm. because it seems like care machine isn't necessarily hiring these kids after the internships yeah so i'm wondering like you know i want to pass that on to people to say like if you're going into an unpaid internship don't think don't think for you know maybe don't think for a second that it guarantees you're going to get hired at the end so how might you take advantage of that otherwise yeah i mean that's something that is a sad reality is there's never a guarantee that internships can get you a job yeah it's, it's <clears throat> i remember being a student and hearing him say oh it's all about timing and thinking oh bullshit what does that mean <laughs> but now the fact that i've been in charge of interns for a while and helped out a lot of our lead in this topic it's just the truth like right. if you don't have enough workflow coming in you can't sustain a new person right like you might be great and we might want to keep you, but it just isn't in the cards for the company at that point in time. Yeah. So I feel like if you're there and if you have the means to take an unpaid internship, and even if you're getting one that's paid, if you're not wringing every ounce of information from that experience right. that you can, you're doing it wrong to begin with. Right. And that's irrelevant of pay. Yeah. And I would also say that even though you might not get hired, I would you know, do your best. And I'm sure that people will to make the best impression, not only on the person that brought you in, like the head of the firm, but all of the designers there, because you Mm -hmm. never know what kind of opportunity that might unlock. And this actually kind of segues into the topic that we were going to talk about, which is Mm -hmm. networking. Um, And, you know, if you're going in as an unpaid intern, it's like, do you have you have access to like really talented designers who are working at this firm? You can make good impressions on them. The other thing is is that somebody like Karim Rashid, he's invited to do all sorts of talks. I'm sure mm-hmm. he goes to like social events and things where there are other designers there, and you know who knows how you might be able to network there. But oh yeah, but uh, Reed, um, you wanted to talk about this, and and I so did. where where should we begin? Uh, the fact that networking is this thing that no one teaches you. Right. And you find out painfully quickly when you get out of school how it's the ticket to getting a job. Yeah. More than 80% of the time, I feel right. like. It's this thing where, I mean, we went to school in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So it's hard to get people to come down there, mm-hmm. which is why James and I were in a van mimicking Aqua Teen Hunger Force <laughs> on the way to a conference. We drove 24 hours straight yeah. each way to go to that conference because we needed to network. Yeah. Like we needed to meet other people outside of just the 30 odd people in our studio. That was, I mean, looking back on it, the, like it was fun at the time and it's even fun to think back on. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, you know, when we were at Purdue, we met some kids that had come out from iowa like driven seven hours to this conference and i'm awesome. like good for you like yeah that's a fun trip to take with a bunch of classmates and you know like great to meet other designers and professional designers like gotta do it yeah so yeah i think networking is this thing that it's it's like public speaking you need yeah. to know how to do it but no one teaches it to you and then if you're good at it and you fall into it, your life's going to be a lot easier potentially. And if right. you're not, you might be banging your head against the wall saying, why am I not getting a job? Why am I not going anywhere? And it's because you can't make a job appear out of your own free will. You have right. to meet the right people and get yourself in front of the people who are going to give you that job. Right. Yeah. The The weird thing though about IDSA events, and I don't know if you have any advice about this, but I remember going to IDSA events and going up and trying to talk to professionals and just kind of feeling like 
I don't know what to say to them. <laughs> and I don't even know that, like, I'm trying to think about a student coming up to me and saying something to where I was like, oh, that was a really w- good way to break the ice. Yeah. Well, I think I said this the first time I was on the podcast. Yeah. Um, but I remember the... What's it called? Right after school, I had a free ticket to the IDSA International Conference. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm going to try and wring as much out of this shit as I possibly can. So I had just gotten a smartphone. It's like the iPhone 3 or something like that. And I remember I was so excited. And what I did was I went on the IDSA website for everyone. I'm not sure if it's up there anymore, but for some reason I found a list of every person who was registered to go. <laughs> And I looked, I cross-referenced every single name until I found out where they all were. I just imagined cork boards with red yarn. And... <laughs> no, I wasn't trying to piece together a murder. I was trying to figure out where they all were. Pepe Sylvia. <laughs> and I basically went and I made flash digital flashcards for every one of the people who were at firms that I wanted to work for. Mm. So I remember specifically, there was a woman, Erica Eden, who I worked with at Smart, and she was there. And I don't know if I ever told her this. And if she's listening, don't think I'm insane. You were just one of the people who worked at a company I wanted to go to. You were just one of Reed's targets. But, my God, this sounds like a serial killer. <laughs> but basically, it didn't, it didn't get me a job at the end of the day. But what I did was I wrote down their name, where they worked, where they had worked, and like articles they had written. Mm-hmm. So if I saw it, I was like, oh, James... I really loved that talk you gave at ASU in 2019. And then it's it's like a little bit of brown nosing, but yeah. not too much where they're like, okay, fuck off. Like, this is too much. <laughs> but it was enough to have a conversation because everyone knows if you're a student, you're going to come over and try and ask for a job. It's, right. It's the undertone of any conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I think back to my, my dating life mm-hmm. and, you know, when you go out with a group of with a group of dudes, which is not advisable to no. go out with just a group of dudes. But the thing is, what are you is talking that about? <laughs> going out with 15 dudes is the best way to meet people. <laughs> You'll get into any club you walk up to. They'll be like, wait, you don't have more guy friends? <laughs> oh, and you guys can't dance? Yeah. This is perfect. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I always found that if you went out with your friends to just have a good time and mm-hmm. not to go out and try and like meet whoever you're trying to meet, then the chances were that you would be more likely to, to like start a conversation with a stranger because the, the energy and the vibe is just like infectious. It's true. I think one thing that's kind of the truth, but also take it with a grain of salt is a lot of designers. I I say when I give this, I have this talk on how to get a job after school. And one of the things I say is networking is important, right? Which is where the, why I was like, Hey, we should talk about networking as If designers ask you to go out and get a drink, it's like the equivalent of like, oh, we're going steady or something like that. It's like it's it's a good it's a good sign. If someone wants to sit and have a beer with you, if you're not 21, do not drink. I can't I don't I can't condone anything if you're not legal. But it's basically it's a good way in which for you to sit down and kind of take the barriers off a little bit and talk. And the reason I brought that up is when you go to conferences and things, there's always inevitably an after party or an after after party. Yeah. And if you put yourself out a little bit and just be like can I come? That's where you're going to like end up sitting down with somebody that you really wanted to meet and have like a really interesting conversation because it's not in a crowded room potentially. And it's just a little more fluid and I don't know, less forced. Yeah. Actually, this reminds me of a story about, um, back at square one conference. Mm. Uh, uh, I think it was talented. Mr. Ripley, uh, Mm -hmm. that's his Instagram handle. Um, I think his name, oh my gosh, this is terrible because I've gotten his name wrong before. So I'm going to make sure that I get it right this time. Um, but, uh, yeah, Henry, I knew it. I knew it, Henry. I knew it all along, but he came up to me at like literally the end of the conference and, and started chatting with me. And I was like, this is a cool kid. And, and kind of, as we were talking, everybody left except for all of the speakers. Mm -hmm. And one of the speakers um, oh, was it uh from from minimal design, Zishan? Yep. Okay. Zishan yeah. Hakim, right? Yeah. So uh, he invited us to to come take a tour of minimal, and Henry was kind of like, like, can I, like, can I come? And and like he like he was asking me, and I said, just don't say anything, just come. I'm like, I don't work here. Yeah, I don't know. Just just come with us. And so it that like kept happening throughout the night. He was like, Can I come to the after party? I'm just like, just just go with it. Yeah, it was just funny. do it. Uh, Wanna add to me that story? 
because of that night, he came and saw our Aladdin last week or two weeks ago. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, he met up with uh, Nick and I as well when he was when he was in New York, and that's that's another thing is um. I do want to say that for for the the various highs and lows of Instagram, I do think that reaching out to a professional on Instagram could be a nice icebreaker Mm -hmm. before meeting them in person. Yep. Um, It's like, it's a pretty non-offensive way to like, you know, like comment on somebody's post and, and like, that's how, that's how I've, I've started conversations with people that I've never met. Yeah. And have made a lot of friends on there. So when I give that presentation, I have the scale of awkward and it's basically LinkedIn is over here, Instagram and Facebook, oh. where it's like LinkedIn, totally fine. Right. Reach out, say what you want, but don't be upset if people ghost you because you get tons of messages on there and you might get a response, you might not, but it's not weird. Maybe some people get tons of messages on LinkedIn. I mean, you're on there. <laughs> you get like recruiters and random stuff. Yeah. Like there's always people like, hey, do you want to come work with this random packaging company in Guam? It's like, <laughs> Um, thank you, but I'm happy where I am. But, um, and then the middle is Instagram where it can be good or it can be like, okay, this is a little aggressive for what Mm -hmm. I want. Um, I usually respond to every message that I get, or I try to, unless they're blatantly stupid questions and then I delete them. (laughs) But if it's a question that I feel like deserves an answer, I always give a response. This is like 98%. I only don't Mm -hmm. answer once in a while. Okay. Um, but there was one I got recently where this person asked me like, 15 questions no. like uh-uh. and it was questions like i'm it's that's something that grinds my gears so hard where it goes reaching out and then there's just wasting my time right and that's something i'd be careful about with social media is that kids these days don't have filters when it comes to what's appropriate to say to people right. and they'll just be like here's my life story i'm gonna tell you this 17 paragraph <laughs> thing about everything and i want you to answer all my questions for me it's like i don't know you yeah i don't even want to give my friends as much help like <laughs> get out of here it's like picking somebody up at the airport oh my gosh um but uh yeah i mean i think that i, I it's it's something that we had to say something about for the questions that people are sending into our, our podcast was please just start with the question mm-hmm. and then give us your life story. Like yeah. at least we can filter through the questions in that way. It's like a resume. I don't want to see your resume until I've seen your portfolio. Yeah. It's I, I like, I understand the inclination and I understand just like wanting to part of it feels like, is this for me or for you? Like part of it feels mm-hmm. like you're just trying to work through this and maybe you're trying to do it in my DMS. Yeah. But it it does seem kind of weird. It's like that exercise of writing a letter to yourself but not sending it. Yeah. Like, it's the same thing. Write it, hold on to it, and look at the next morning and see if you still want to send it. Exactly. But uh, so so let's let's say once you once you have your first job, mm-hmm. and sometimes, you know, for some people, your first job is not your ideal job. Yeah. So what what do you do from there? What's the networking strategy from that job? Well, I think you can even take a step back from that and think about internships. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, I, hopefully you're not oh, in right. a job that's not your ideal job. Right. But if it's an internship, take as many as you want. Like, it could be an internship or it can be great. <laughs> like, it doesn't, it, like, literally it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because even if you have a bad internship, it shows you what you don't want. Right. Which is almost as valuable as what you do want at the end of the day. Yeah. But I think one thing that's great is when you're at those jobs, even if it's unpaid or paid or three months or whatever length, you're meeting these people. And I always show a picture of our studio. Remember, we all like jumped in the air and they took photos of oh, us. Oh yeah! I was like, that was our first network. Right. Sorry. Um, but the second network is when you have internships, and those people are ones that even if you don't end up working there, you will run into them later. And right. if you do a good job, they'll vouch for you. And that's the type of stuff you need to do. So that's why I say, if even if it's not perfect, take it because yeah. you you never know. As I'm always a fan of. Throwing out as many seeds as possible and seeing which ones actually turn into something down the road. Throwing out your seed? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just, oh, man. I don't even know. I, I Nick's mom it. is listening, James. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Or maybe no, she, I mean, it's, a, it's a, you know, like the seeds of, uh, of new jobs. Yeah. Of, <laughs> of potential opportunities. I'm just imagining a, like a pan on my head like Johnny Appleseed <laughs> walking around like, yeah. Apple seeds. <laughs> In people's faces. Yeah. He was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah, absolutely. I think um 
I mean, the the thing was, and I haven't yet thanked you in person, Reed, but thank you for my first internship. James, if I hear you say it one more time. <laughs> thank you, Reed. It's the reason I'm in New York. You would have done it for me. Yes, I would have. Um, and but... also, you shouldn't even thank me. You should technically thank Ion. Right. Uh, oh, no, no. It was Ion? I think it was Ion. He's the, the one who introduced me to it. The Godfather. But there was, it was a whole, it was, no, Kelly Harrigan. Kelly, yeah, Kelly Harrigan was the first one. And then Ion, and yeah. then me, and yeah. then you, and then Chris, and then Paul? Oh, no, not Paul. Who was the last one? I think it was Chris. Chris. There was a whole string of VT people that went through there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, until they wise, wised up to our scheme. Yeah. <laughs> and then it and then it turned out that that sunk the whole company. They're like, wait, none of you guys are talented. <laughs> Why are you even here? So, you have um, great networking skills. <laughs> so talentless as I was, I walked yeah. into that internship. And, I mean, that was a great internship because there were a ton of designers there, really talented designers. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, like, I, I mean, I did everything... I, I think I could to make a good impression. And Oscar was there with me as well. That's it, yeah. We Can't held, forget Oscar. We held a mouse together. They didn't have much uh, for us as interns, but... That was very nice. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that was that was a great experience and, and met a lot of amazing designers, made some connections there, yeah. but... Shout out Ferris. Yeah. Shout out... Um, oh, man. Aaron, Aaron Saxon. Saxon. Is it Saxton or Saxon? Saxton, I think. I watch too many Viking shows. <laughs> Aaron Saxon. <laughs> uh, Julia Troy, Adam Pascal. Adam Pascal. He he's at, he's at uh, what's it called? BuzzFeed now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, Rick Gannis. Oh, Richard yeah. Richard Gannis. The, the shop master extraordinaire. Yeah. And uh, God, if we forget oh, anybody, Gaz. it's going to be total. Oh, yeah. Gaz. Gaz Brown. Oh, Gaz. Yeah. Oh, and Crafty Kate. And Nina. Th oh yeah nina yeah, yeah she was working on a bunch of back stuff come on there. and i think th they hired a bunch of other designers after we left actually mm -hmm. one of the founders uh co-founders of visibility studio was an employee at quirky really yeah interesting um joseph uh guerra i'm probably pr mispronouncing your last name i'm sorry um <laughs> i do it all the you time you don't apologize to kareem but you apologize to him no it's karim is it I'm pretty sure. We got to ask him. We He needs to be your next guest. I we're listen, we're sliding so hard into those DMs. We're trying. Um, You're networking. Yeah. We are we are networking. But I I will say that um so after after Quirky, I went to Lifetime Brands and that's where that's where I like really was able to I mean, I was there for three years. I was able to make a more well-rounded impression and mm -hmm. also show growth throughout the years. And I mean, how long were you at Smart? Two years. And you you got you got a job at Smart mm -hmm. after your internship. It was an odd circumstance where I did a three month internship, which turned into six months of freelance, mm -hmm. and then I was there for full time for what's it? A year and three months. So I count the whole thing as two years. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. How did you How did you finally uh, break down the door into full time? It was terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I got offered a full time job at Stanley Black and Decker up yeah. in New Britain, Connecticut. Yeah. And it was a nice job. Paid a shitload more. They offered to pay for my grad school and all these nice perks and things. Yeah. But um, I was really committed to staying in New York, and I really wanted to be at Smart. So I went in. And I said I'd been here for nine months, and I asked for a meeting with uh what's it called my my manager and then his boss mm -hmm. and i sat there i said i was offered a full-time job i have shown you everything i can give you you know i want to be here i love this company and this was yeah. a wednesday and i said if i don't know by friday i won't be here monday and this is me saying it ballsy after that, the fact. I mean, it that's... probably it probably wasn't <laughs> and, that and like if, and if it's not i'll not be in here on everything's everything's better in <laughs> as, hindsight as like a, a watermark is expanding on your pants it was terrifying they told me at like 5 45 on friday oh. and i was sitting there shitting my pants just like what did i do literally, literally did i everybody. do this i should have just stayed as a freelancer and oh figured it gosh. out but then luckily they gave me a full-time job and it was it worked out that's awesome well i mean that's a case for being strategically bold sometimes you have to be strategically bold yeah. if you want the thing that you want being bold is scary but yeah you gotta do it once in a yeah. while um which which actually uh, to kind of go back to the karam thing briefly um karam did actually respond to his uh to his detractors on the article 
Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll see if I can find what he said, but essentially it people, you know, people saying that people of means would not be able to intern with care with Karam, but he was saying that he basically was saying he came from a low income family. He worked multiple jobs. He kind of, it sounded like from the age of 16, he kind of knew what he wanted to do. And in order Mm. to intern in places like Italy, where that is a tradition of of sort of these unpaid apprenticeship like uh, internships, that he saved up money from like three jobs from DJing, from doing like fashion illustrations, mm-hmm. and made it happen. And, and I mean that's that's also strategically bold. That's like that's the long game. That's yeah. really thinking ahead. Um, but yeah, that's that's a cool story, Reed. Mm-hmm. So well, it's the same thing where it's like I wanted to work at Smart, and so I lived at home while I was doing it. Right. Sometimes you got to just do what you got to do to get what you want. Yeah. Um, now, uh, would you say, like, w- what would you say about your time at Smart in terms of, of networking? And and what were you trying to achieve in terms of networking? Because I feel like at different stages mm-hmm. in your life, you may be trying to achieve something slightly different. Yeah. Although you're always looking for maybe a different, um, like, at some point, you're maybe looking for an opportunity that... I guess you're looking for something that's going to push you up to the next level. Mm-hmm. Or... Well, I mean, I think the funny thing is part of the reason I took the internship at Quirky was because it was strategically next door to Smart. Oh. I wanted to be as close as possible. <laughs> and I'm not even making that up. <laughs> like, I remember they said, could you have you in for an interview? But like, I can be over in three and a half minutes. Whoa. Like, I'll be I over mean, if you need me to. That is powerful mm-hmm. to be able to do something like that. I mean, just being, you know, that's the thing of like just being in the same city as as the place that you want to intern yep. um, can be really powerful because if you're in another state, it it's just it's unfortunately easier for them to pass pass you up. Yeah, I mean, I think the harder thing, which is unfortunately a sad truth, is if you're international, it's even harder. Right. Because visas are a giant issue. Yeah. And if you're right out of school, you have a year window to have your visa before you have to get a job or yeah. leave, I, yeah. which is from my brief understanding of dealing with interns, how that usually works. Yeah. And that's one that's hard. I feel like in the United States, it's more, it's like a minor hiccup of like, can you pay for it? Or there it's like, can you pay for it? And are you going to get deported after a year? Right. So that's a whole other thing. Yeah. No, that's, that is definitely tricky. But um, so, so yeah, while you're at Smart, what what's the kind of networking i mean that's when you started yeah. your instagram for one yeah that was funny like that whole thing was just instagram was not something that ever intended to be anything other than just practice yeah uh, i shouted him out the last two times i was on here and i'm going to continue doing because he's awesome ron who runs a shop at smart he's still there his name is gray equinox on instagram he nice. makes cool shit you should go check him out yeah but uh he showed all his awesome things and i was inspired of basically i'm not doing anything creative for myself so i started instagram Different story. But basically, the whole networking thing was working there. I still keep in touch with people from there all the time. I feel like that's something you'll realize for anyone who hasn't had a full-time job yet, how much the relationships you make stick for a long time, which is really important. Yeah. No, it is really important. It's important to keep those relationships alive. I mean, um, I still still work with some people that I used to work with. Mm and yeah, like occasionally we'll grab beers with people that I used to work with. And I mean, it's just, it's just like, it's fun. I mean, for the students out there, you know what your relationship is like with your studio classmates. Like I would say that, that ideally studios continue to sort of be that kind of way Mm -hmm. and where it's like slightly familial and you know, it's, you're, you're creating sort of like long lasting bonds through, through these trials and tribulations of product development. I'd be curious to know what studios like now with social media, because when we were in school, Instagram, just like the year we were juniors when it came out or seniors. So it was still like, I'm taking pictures of my breakfast (laughs) and here's my feet at the beach. (laughs) It was an awful filter. Like it was not at all what it is now. Legs or hot dogs. Oh yeah, that whole yep. I remember that. <laughs> Lots of food. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah. And so when you so you like started your Instagram while you were at Smart, and mm-hmm. then at what point were you networking for your next job? I think so. Something I was trying to do at Smart was 
I didn't want to go anywhere. All I wanted was smart design. So right. I was intentionally trying to build relationships in my current job because something I found is that if you're a fly on the wall intern and they're like, oh, where did Bob go? Oh, he left. It's like, oh, okay. Like you oh, want to be yeah. somebody that they're like, no, you can't get rid of Bob. <laughs> Bob's great. Like if yeah. people are emotionally attached to you, it's harder to get rid of you at the end right. of the internship. So knowing people getting to know everyone like something i always say you need to do is i, I do this today because like i i don't like when i'm the new person it's, it's hard being a new person somewhere so whenever we have new people in the office i always set up a lunch date in the first week and yeah. a half they're there like go and meet them and you should do the same thing if you're an intern ask the ceo of your company anybody people like who was it detulo was he talking about he mm-hmm. met with the ceos of nike and that's how we got all of his cool shoes out there it was like meeting the right people right he's like no one ever does this and yeah. it's true like Put yourself out there, be a little bold, meet the right people, and you're going to be better off no matter how it slices. Yeah. You know, I was I was actually thinking about this on the way over. Do you remember in season, I think it's season one of Crashing, the show with Pete mm-hmm. Holmes on HBO, he's in the green room with TJ Miller, and yeah. TJ Miller is like, you know, like as, as an opener, like part of your job is just to be a good hang. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, it is something that will that will boost you in like, yeah, to not being a nameless intern to being somebody that people like hanging out with. I mean, I remember going out for countless, you know, drinks and stuff after work with, with, uh, you know, people that I've worked with and Mm -hmm. that's a great way to like make relationships. I mean, you know, drink responsibly. Yes. (laughs) So how did you keep your network going from your time at Lifetime Brands? Well, um, my manager from Lifetime Brands, when when he left and joined Peloton, I uh, had also left. I'd started doing part-time work for my dad, but I was looking to stay in New York and start this freelancing career. Mm-hmm. And thank you, know, thank you to Jason Poor. He brought me into Peloton. And, uh, and so I was able to start freelancing there. And through, through them... I've, I've met people who I've then, um, you know, people have left Peloton and I've gone to work for them or I've met, I've met other people through just connections. And I mean, that's how it's literally like parties and, and yeah, just like working with people. That's, Mm -hmm. that's how I've managed to secure a lot of my freelance gigs. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a sad fact that applying to the website is always the hardest way to get the job. Right. Yeah. Something that I've been talking about and I talked about at the Purdue thing was this idea of pushing your portfolio up the stack. Mm -hmm. And uh, this isn't necessarily a networking thing, but I I wondered if you had any thoughts on like, if you're, if you're just like cold uh, emailing somebody to, for a job and you're trying to push your portfolio up the stack, Yeah. how, how do you think is, what do you think is a good way to do that? So I have to disagree with one thing you've said in the podcast before, which I know came from Tony Smith, who is also my friend. Yeah. But don't call the office. <laughs> I, I don't know under what scenario that'll ever do anything positive. For yeah. You, at least in my experience. Like, yeah. if you might get the, you might get a nice person. Actually, at Aura Leiden, a fun fact is random people answer the phone. So you might get me one day. Like, you yeah. don't know who's going to It's literally whose phone the desk is on. People are going to start playing read roulette. If you do that, you guys are going to get me in trouble. So don't do that. <laughs> but, it, but I'm saying, even if you do that, and even if I didn't answer it, if I answer it, I'm going to especially say, go away because of, <laughs> of this podcast. But I mean, it's something that it's just, it's a tricky thing where actually are leading the best way to get us your attention our attention is to apply through the website because we have a mm. back-end system so okay. it actually if you apply through an email it's easier for me to forget you because you're not in my queue of people yeah. on the back-end system so that's one where i'm actually not trying to just brush you off by say apply through the website is actually the best way to do it yeah um but when it comes to getting your resume and your portfolio up on the stack Honestly, the number one thing that I see in like I've been looking through portfolios since Smart Design. I was one of the intern coordinators at Smart. I was the intern coordinator at Frog, and now I do all the intern stuff at Our Leiden. And because I've seen thousands of portfolios, and the number one thing is if your first page that has a splash page, your products aren't sexy, I'm only going to give you like three scroll, like three little scrolls before mm. I like decide like. You need to catch people's attention in the first few seconds. Yeah. It's just people are visual. 
and there's when there's I haven't checked in a few days, and there's forty five applications waiting for me for right. tomorrow. Yeah, and I don't have time to go. Oh, the first page looks terrible. Let me see what the rest looks like. <laughs> it's like you need you need that page needs to be immaculate. Like yeah, if if that's the number one thing, and then the rest needs to obviously support it. But I mean, right. Get that you need to catch great. people's attention. You got to do it. Um, now, Reed, I think we should probably move on to questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the questions, we actually got a voicemail this week. And uh, by the way, guys, that number is 1-646-494-4011. Uh, if you want to call in, I mean, we get about one voicemail a week, so you're bound to get played on the podcast. I've been waiting. I need to figure out what I want to ask you, but you're going to get <laughs> one from me. Is it going to be in a cryptic accent, or is it going to be your actual voice? I don't know. Oh. I don't. I don't have many accents, so <laughs> it'll probably be my voice. Um. So, Reed, can you uh can you play that voicemail? Oh yeah, this is our phones out. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not being rude. Uh, what am do, I doing? Do, 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 okay. Do. Okay. Hold it up to the mic. Hey, James and Reed. Uh, my name is Cliff. I'm a industrial design student who's going to be graduating soon. And I was really wondering, as I'm applying to jobs. Um, what are some good questions to ask some of the studios or hiring managers that are you're going to be encountering? Every time they ask me, you know, do you have any questions about the role? I never know really what to say, you know, like, do I ask what kind of programs I use or what kind of work I'll be doing? And I'm always kind of at a loss. Um, also, if you have time, like, I'd love for you guys to discuss how do you determine you know, when you're a really young junior designer, you haven't had many jobs, uh, how to negotiate your salary, you know, how much to ask to be paid. That's sort of a pretty intimidating task for a lot of us people who, um, you know, don't really have a ton of experience. Anyway, love the show. Can't wait to hear from you guys. Thanks. All right. Awesome. Thank you for the question. Um, Reed, what do you think? What are some questions to ask when an interviewer asks you, do you have any questions? So when I was at Virginia Tech, I took this class called Interviewing Techniques. Yeah. And it was probably one of the most useful classes I took while I was there. And one of the pieces of advice that the faculty member gave me, his name was Gregory Justice. If you're at Virginia Tech, seek him out. Awesome dude. Yeah. But basically, he said, when you're in an interview, you should always have questions, which is a no-brainer. But he took it a step further and even said, have a notebook with them written out. When they ask you that, if you're in person or even if you're over Skype, take the notebook out, pull it out, tell them you need a second. It switches the power dynamic to you all of a sudden interviewing them. And it shows that you are prepared and that you actually give a shit. And it's not just you scattershot a bunch of portfolios out and then you happen to get a catch and now you're here and you don't really know why you want to be there. So I think having the questions prepared, but also how you actually ask them is a big thing yeah see the, the way that i typically change the power dynamic is to get up and sit in their lap but, yeah that works too <laughs> um but no that's a really good point i i i think having questions before you go into the interview like kind of have like w- what kind of questions might those be though yeah so that's the real question uh i think something that's good or i'm not sure how much i should say because it's going to ruin all my interviews but i mean i always ask why were you drawn to my company? Like, mm. why do you why do you want to work here? And a lot of times, people give very lackluster answers of, "Oh, you guys do great work," or "I love your website," or "I follow your Instagram page." It's like, no, I want to know like why you think we're different than other people, and why you think that this is the right place for you to grow, and why you think you're the right person for us to hire. So I think really doing your research and finding out why the place you're interviewing at is somewhere that is valuable for both parties. Right. And then I also think when you're actually interviewing having a few questions that are just super simple. Like you don't have to have a lot of experience to think about what's it like on a daily day. And like, what's it like day to day to be an intern? What's the team structure? Like um, what type of projects can I expect to be on? Yeah. Just general things that for obviously for us, it's like a no brainer, but we know that you're an intern. So like knowing that you have enough, I don't know, mental fortitude to think of those things ahead of time. It's yeah. always good. Yeah. Uh, what about, uh, can I buy you a drink? Is that an appropriate question? Um, I think coffee is probably <laughs> a, a more appropriate one. Um, but I think that's something else where that's like a bold move. I'm joshing. I'm joshing. I mean, I don't. I mean, it happens all the time. Yeah, but uh, I mean, maybe maybe another thing is like like what is your what does your studio do for fun? Mm-hmm. Like, is that? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. 
I mean, what about you? What would you want to hear? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, obviously, endless praise. Like, that's, <laughs> that's number one. That's not, how I got, that's not, how I got in the podcast. Today. Not so much questions, but, but statements. Whoa. Sorry. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I don't know. I, the thing is, is that being a freelancer, you rarely interview anybody. So mm. I can't say that I've really interviewed anyone. It's the worst when you say, do you have any questions? They said no. Oh, it's like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. I mean, it's just weird. It's just yeah. awkward. Like, you have no questions? Like, yeah. how do you have none? So, yeah, I mean, I think if you're... You should know what you bring to the table mm -hmm. and why you're good at it. Yeah. You should know... I think something that's also good is being a little vulnerable. Like, what are some things you want to learn from oh, this internship? Oh, yeah, that's great. What are some things you want to improve upon? Like, yeah. That was something that you, that was some advice that you gave to me when I was going into my internship at Quirky, which was, I, I found was like made the team like me even more was going up to Adam Pascal and saying like, I really need to work on my model making skills. Like, is there something I can do, you know? And he, like, he was just so eager mm -hmm. to, to help me out and, and like set me up with a, with a little job to to make models for the photo shoots, which was, yeah. which was a lot of fun. It's good for both parties. It's a little bit of ego stroking Yeah, of your explaining to them by showing that you need to learn that they're good at what you want to know, Yeah, which is always nice. Yeah. Which is not, should not be the way you approach everything, but like <laughs> it's, it's a human nature to a certain degree. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you're an intern, you're there to learn. Right. Get as much out of it as you can. Yeah. Now there was one more question that he had. Yeah. They said salary and everything. Oh yeah. So I feel like that's one that's a lot harder because you don't really have any chips to play. Right. Like when I went to Smart, I was so happy that I took whatever they gave me. Right. And obviously, you can do whatever negotiating you feel comfortable with. And they're not going to say, like, get out of here, you greedy person. <laughs> like, leave. Like, unless you come back and say, I want double the salary or yeah. something. Like, but I think you should just go in with your numbers in mind. You should, I think something that's very reasonable is there's a website called Glassdoor yeah. where if it's still this way, I'm not sure, but the, the website makes you pay for it, but mm. the app used to have a mistake where it was free for a little while. Oh. But that was a few years ago, so it might Pro not be tip. that way anymore. Um, yeah, I mean, and and then there's also Coraflot. Don't they do the sort of mm -hmm. um, median salaries of different locations? Yeah, they do. Um, and so I, I actually used that when I went into negotiating. Actually, so this is a kind of a funny story. My... So... When I went to go work at Lifetime Brands, uh, I went into the interview, went through my portfolio, um, and at the end of the interview, I did not expect this to happen, but he, but uh, my boss, my future boss, asked me what I would like. Like, I didn't know that he was going to offer me a job on the spot, hmm. and so I... I was like in my head. I was like, "Oh my god, what do grown ups make?" Like, I didn't. I had no idea. Yeah. I just. I. I had no frame of reference, and so luckily, I. I had. I. I. You know, had the thought to improvise on the spot and just say, uh, "Can I get back to you on that?" Yeah, that's uh, good. Yeah, I was because because I was about to like say a number that was so like so low twenty thousand yeah. dollars no it's like literally but i um but yeah so i just went i went back home and researched and i think i actually called some people and i might have actually mm -hmm. called adam pascal from quirky and asked him you know what was a reasonable salary for somebody my age very good idea um and uh and so yeah i actually so i but the frustrating thing was i went higher than I than I thought I should like I thought I was gonna negotiate down to something, and they took the first offer, which at the time is exciting. Mm -hmm. But then later, thinking back on it, you're like, oh god, I could have gotten more. You got your higher offer. It's yeah, fine. hindsight's always twenty twenty. Yes, it is. Um, uh, but yeah, great questions. Um, uh, do we think we have one time for one more question? I think we got a few more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. We've got uh, Jacques uh, at uh, J B O T H A dot design. 
Uh, and they ask, what's your opinion on the Philippe Stark AI chair? Um, do you think we should start considering using generative design more when we design? Also, do you think that the ability to use generative design methods, companies can easily replace the need for industrial designers with, ex with existing engineers? Um, and for those of you who don't know the AI chair, I didn't until I got this question. And this is it if you're watching the YouTube channel. Um, so for those of you at home, you should look it up. But it, it, how would you describe this to somebody who can't see it, Reed? Uh, it's like Ross Lovegrove made it. Yeah, it is, it is a little Captain Organic-y. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think it's, a, it's kind of a handsome chair. I, I like it. Mm -hmm. um, I think from what I've seen of generative design, to me, this looks like it was put through the generative design. It was actually a collaboration with Autodesk. Um, so, uh, it's funny. We had Paul Sohi on the podcast who works at Autodesk and, and he does a lot with generative design and had done those skateboard trucks. So this was used using the same methods. This mm. was designed using the same methods. Um, this, this very much seems like after they put it through the program, a designer went through and, and yeah. smoothed it out. Um, I wonder if you can put the seat in the back in and then say, build around this. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how this works. I never used it. Before. Yeah, they actually, if I can get if I can get to his website, they actually had a video, um, with uh with basically like the process, like the video process of everything that hmm. that happened when they set up the parameters. Uh, because I think they they did essentially set up the parameters of like back of seat, arms, seat, and then just like where the forces, like the loads are coming in. That's cool. Um, so what's our opinion? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I think that it's obviously going to become a part of our industry in some way. But I, the thing is, is that I don't think the technology is there yet to like, or I, I don't know, it, it's not... It's not like after this is invented, all of a sudden everything is going to be mm -hmm. this generative design. I think it's it's almost a style in and of itself. Yeah, it's very Stranger Thingsy. Yeah, it feels like the, the upside down, all yeah. like that like swoopy kind of cobwebby type stuff. I think this is an example of one that's been done really well. Yeah, um, my inner minimal designer kind of <laughs> wishes a few things were a little straighter and everything, but you right. know, I appreciate what it was made with and I think it's nice. Um, it's not one that I probably myself would buy, Yeah, but I give a lot of credit for people who are doing new techniques. Right. The other thing is, and we, you know, we did this series where we were using the different form families mm -hmm. to generate designs that we, we might not usually, I could see, in the coming years doing something like setting up this generative um design uh you know software through something like fusion mm -hmm. just to see what kind of possibilities the computer could generate yeah. and then from there use that as inspiration rather than inspiration boards to come up with new forms and things like that because i mean that's essentially what they've done here yeah i mean it's interesting because, I mean, I feel like all the generative design has a very similar style. Right. Even though they're very different from each other, they're all basically the same thing, mm -hmm. just with different struts and structures and different thicknesses. And Yeah. So, but at the same time, hey, Autodesk, give us a free, uh, what's it called? What's this software called? Do we even know? Fusion. It, it's, it's, I think it's built into Fusion 360. The generative stuff is? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, yeah, check it out. Check it out. Um. I, I think that's the case. And if I'm wrong, let me know. Um, yeah, let's try it out. But yeah, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, I want to thank Reed for being a guest host. I want to thank you, James. <laughs> <laughs> you're, my tw you're my twinkle. This is <laughs> twinkle down the street. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, Nick, Nick is in Italy and uh, I'm going to be thankful when he comes back because it make it has made me realize how much of uh the podcast he leads and hmm. how much i'm i'm able to just enjoy yeah uh but no this was this was really fun 
uh, to do this with Reed. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to one more question, but maybe you can talk to him off the podcast or maybe we can uh, do another podcast sometime. But Tim Zarkey uh, wanted to know about your Legos. Can I give a two second answer? Yeah, give, give us a two second answer. Go to Muji and buy all of their What's it called? Milky plast polypropylene things. Yeah. They're great. This is this is for uh, specifically for Lego organization. Tim yeah. Zarkey was asking about on the Discord. Hey, get on the Discord. I think there's a link in our Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some lively conversation happening on that on there. I would say it really uh, shot up during this whole debate about uh, Karim Rashid and the unpaid internship. Um, but yeah, get in there, show your work. Uh, let us know your thoughts. You know, of course, we're just telling you what we know right now in our careers. We're not necessarily experts, uh, but we're trying to pass on the knowledge that we've gained. But we would love to hear what your opinions are on the topics that we've covered today. Um, how do you like to network? Uh, what do you think about AI design? And uh, what would you ask an interviewer? Um, yeah. And yeah. The key takeaway always network when you can especially if you're in a place that has lots of opportunities around you because it's a big valuable thing that you shouldn't let go to waste absolutely um and so shout out to kiyoshi the kid for... are we doing our shout out for the week oh the shout out of the week oh my gosh reed i'm not even a, I'm, not even, I'm like the fake you're host. now an official co-host this because is my, this is my because time. you've gotten me back on track okay so they let me pick again because <laughs> because uh i'm filling in so this time I picked Spear Mintier. He is the only mechanical engineer I know who has... Actually, that's not true. My friend Heidi has this too. These are my yeah. two mechanical engineers I work with that are almost as equally as talented in industrial design as they are as engineering. And he is a internationally famous robot builder now. He mm. fights on the battle bots of China. So he's got these crazy robots. He has a really eclectic style, and you can see that he really knows design. And if you had Brooklyn Brewery in the last few years, he did all of their rendering. And they actually weren't photos. It was a few years ago, so it might be a little outdated now. But check him out. Really cool stuff. I love geeking out on things like this. Yeah. And if you like robots slash design, he also works at Frog. You should go check out his work. Yeah. And costumes. He's the one who got me into the whole thing. The oh, beginning. really? He had an amazing costume that was Joffrey from Game of Thrones. And I said, I'm going to make a better costume. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally where this whole thing started was Adam. That's awesome. Yeah. So check him out. Yeah. Go check him out. I remember this skateboard from the, uh, from the frog. Yeah. Uh, he's hilarious. Yeah. He does stuff just to piss people off sometimes. And he's like, I'm just going to make a skateboard out of a piece of acrylic. I love it. And I'm done. It's awesome. He's, yeah. He's great. So go check him out. Uh, that's at Spear Minter and that's Spear, S-P-E-A-R, Mintier. M I N T I E R. It's because his last name is Wrigley. It's Wrigley Gum. Spearmint. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh. Yeah. He's a clever lad. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly I'm Scottish. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah. So uh, intro and outro by Kiyoshi the Kid. Uh, check us out on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play. Um, uh, somebody was telling me to get on YouTube Music. That's another thing. Uh, We're too old, James. I, <laughs> somebody t- t- told me to get on Zoo Tunes. Oh, I man. No, I don't. I know that's. Uh, I just made that up. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, thank you again, Reed. Uh, I uh, so yeah. I, I've never done the outro. I've never started the outro before. So I guess uh, I'm at I draw on receipts. And I'm at my name, Reed Dutch Legal. Yeah. Later.